Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Hello, hello, hello. No.
Testing. Testing one, two, three. Testing four, five, six. Hi. Yes, hi, Stephen. Good to see you. There's an ice cream truck right outside. <laughs> Most things are. I'm going to do it in the end. So at the end, after you finished up, I'd like the microphone and I'll tell them tell people about the process for January. Okay. We just hang around and hang around. Yeah. Okay. They don't have a speaker for you. I've got gun. I know, but then I'll give it to you. Are you thinking of a feature? We'll work. Maybe not. Hello, everybody. Uh, it looks like the seats are filling up and there are seats down in the uh, B1 level in the exercise room. And so uh, that's available. Uh, thank you for being here today. And thank you to the people on HHTV who are watching. Um, my name is John Hamm and I'm very happy to be a resident here at Horizon House. And I um, am uh, once a day, once again, in, uh, having Dr. Rhodes here to speak about uh, mindfulness practice. And for those of you uh, last month who did not get a chance to hear Dr. Rhodes speak about stress and how it affects the brain and the body in general uh, and the introduction to mindfulness, that information is on HH Connect and uh, 
on the K4 app. And uh, the information from today's presentation will also be on those two platforms. Today, Dr. Rhodes uh, is going to speak on mindfulness and pra the practice of different mindfulness techniques. And he'll give us an opportunity to do some of the, those practices. And you'll notice that you have cards on your seats. And uh, I'll tell you more about that after the presentation. But obviously, the, 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 they list several different mindfulness techniques. And we want to have you choose one of those techniques. Um, Dr. Rhodes, as you may remember, is a neuropsychologist. He uh, is a, a, an associate professor of neurology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. In his practice, he teaches people mindfulness for stress uh, disorders and problems, but he also treats uh, cognitive impairment and memory impairment. And his uh, practice is focused on non-pharmacologic treatments, and mindfulness is one of those treatments that can be very powerful in helping people cope with stress and anxiety and depression, uh, cognitive, mild cognitive impairment. So with that, I'll, I'm pleased to once again introduce Dr. Christopher Rhodes. So much. Yeah, how's that sound? Oh, I'm gonna take this off. How about that? Is that better? That's better. Uh, sound okay? Volume's all right? Excellent. All right, well, thank you again. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to come back for part two. Apparently I didn't screw part one up enough to get disinvited. So we'll see if that holds true for today too. Um, I'm gonna slide this forward. So my, my thought today was to do three things. And you can go ahead and advance a, a slide or maybe even two. Uh, let's see here. I, I don't want to bludgeon you with information today. That's not my goal. But um, my hope was, yeah, okay. Um, to just spend a very, very brief kind of amount of time talking about mindfulness and how it applies to stress through the lens of cognitive change and particularly Alzheimer's disease. That is my area of expertise, one of them. It's what I do in my clinical practice. Uh, and it's a good lens, I think, through which to kind of look at this, because I would offer you that changes in memory, whether they're normal age-associated changes, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, other dementias, are inherently stressful. And uh, part of our approach in helping people live well with stressful things, such as dementia, or being a care partner for somebody with dementia, is to teach them ways to manage stress, uh, namely mindfulness meditation in my kind of Part of the world. So I was going to spend maybe 30 minutes or so kind of covering the data around what we know around mindfulness-based approaches, particularly in neurological or Alzheimer's disease kind of conditions, to spend maybe 15 minutes running through some examples of mindfulness practices, and then maybe we'll have about 15 minutes or so for discussion. Does that sound okay? All right. I, I won't take offense if you get up and make a run for the door at this point or any point. Uh, but let's go ahead and uh, maybe advance another couple of slides here. So we, we talked a lot at the first presentation, if you were here, and I appreciate you coming back if you were, I appreciate you coming if you weren't, uh, about what mindfulness is and what it is not. And I think of it, uh, you can maybe go one more slide. We'll get through these pretty quickly, if you would. Um, the intentional attention to some aspect of the moment Right? So we are not just paying attention to what's going on, but we're doing so on purpose in a very specific way versus spending time in the what was or the what if. And in my work with people with changing cognition, it's hard to disengage from those in terms of I used to be able to do X, Y, and Z, I no longer can. That happens for physical reasons, that happens for cognitive reasons, or the what if, right? So, oh my gosh, if my memory is this bad now, and I have something that I know is going to get worse, what are things going to be like in a year, two years, three years? You know, we don't live year, two years, three years at a time, but it's hard to disengage from that. And I think of the what was as a recipe for depression. I think of the what if as a recipe for anxiety. So the more we can bring it back to the what is, helps people live well in the moment. 
It is also, I think, a set of tools that helps us investigate the things in our lives that cause stress, some of which are not changeable, right? We don't have a cure for Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. We do have ways to cope with it, treat it, deal with it. Uh, but you need an accurate appraisal of what's going on and are there things you could change? You know, so we, we talked a little bit about acceptance last time and the fact that acceptance does not mean inaction or giving up. And in fact, it's a kind of a prerequisite to being able to do something to cope with what's going on. So what can you change? What can you not change? Mindfulness enhances our ability to kind of understand those parameters and what we might have some influence over. You can go uh, one more slide if you would, please. So I'm not going to bore you also with a ton of neuroscience, but I do want to set the stage for kind of why this potentially intersects with things like Alzheimer's disease or other dimensions. So we know after, you know, years and years and years of study and animal models, human models, that the brain is divided into different regions. These different regions do different functions. So my occipital lobes back here are critical in vision. My frontal lobes up here are critical in things like planning and problem solving. Uh, attention, concentration. We know that the middle part of my frontal lobe and yours is critical in terms of selective attention. So freedom from distractibility, paying attention to this one thing and ignoring something else going on. And we also know that the way the brain functions is connected to its structure, but it's not wed to it entirely. So if we think about kind of the way the brain's orchestrated or organized, you've got cells. And if you think about a, a neuron in the brain as cell body is kind of where my shoulder is, long tube called an axon and then connections, dendrites between other cells. Uh, if we go forward one slide here, what we know is that some people have more of these connections and cells than others. And one of the reasons I, I get asked every once in a while why I chose to work with older adults and part of it is this, that there is no greater variability in any age group than older adults. So there's a tremendous amount of variability with kids. There's maybe a little bit less as we kind of hit middle age. But then you think about the people that you know who are over the age of 80. And there are some who are doing amazingly well, and there are some who are not. And we know that that's true in terms of cortical function, volume. If you can go forward one more too. Part of the reason for that is stress and how our brains respond to stress, as well as disease and other diseases. But what I can tell you, and we talked a little bit about this, is that years and years and years of chronic stress have very demonstrable and reliable effects on the brain. And subregions are will respond by getting bigger. So particularly our threat appraisal networks, that part of our brains that's designed to figure out is that safe? Is that not safe? Where's the next threat coming from? Those areas get really kind of highly developed. And then unfortunately, they can't sustain that kind of growth and then will atrophy. And then other parts of the brain, like our hippocampus, you know, the center for short-term memory, is very responsive to stress in a negative way in that it interferes with cellular function and cellular structure in some of those different parts of the brain. If you can go forward one more, please. So here's at the micro level, kind of neuron response to stress. Too much stress yields you know, growth in those areas of the brain that are the threat centers, like the orbital frontal cortex um, and the amygdala. And then those areas that are sensitive to stress, like our memory centers and some of our planning and problem solving centers uh, respond by shrinking. So the stress hormones like cortisol, epinephrine, all shape kind of cellular function and structure. Why this becomes important, if you go one more slide, is that this is intimately related to what happens as we age and what is vulnerable as we age. So we know, classic question in our clinic is, I'm experiencing these things. You know, I go into a room and I forget why I went in there. I run into somebody and I can't remember their name. There are times where, boy, I just can't find that word. Or boy, and we, we talked about that, but I don't remember the details of when that appointment is or where that exactly is. Some of that is absolutely normal. Some of that normal aging and change can be exacerbated by stress and those kind of cellular and network changes. And then unfortunately, if you can click one more, there is a little bit of animation in here. 
For others of us, about 6.5 million Americans, we're on a different pathway, meaning that we are developing things like Alzheimer's disease and potentially the syndrome of cognitive change and functional impairment that follows that. And this is a very slow, gradual process that starts in midlife. So as I stand here before you today, could I have Alzheimer's disease? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. I could have the plaques and the tangles starting to form in my brain. Given my family history, I would be worried about that. You know, very personal connection to the disease. And as that process continues, if you click one more time, there is a different curve in terms of our thinking abilities as we age. So more significant changes in memory or language. And if you can click three times, please. The important things to think about here though, are that there's a silent phase of that disease. There's a mild kind of, I've got changes that are noticeable, but I can cope pretty well with them versus I've got significant changes that now impact my function. Can't drive, manage my medications, finances. And the theory here, if you can click one more, is that this is a very, and then maybe a couple of times. Let's see here. Let's go three times. Two. Perfect. Yes. Uh, I'm not used to not being able to drive my own slides, but uh, <laughs> we're working on it here. Um, this is a very long process. So this is the traditional curve for something like Alzheimer's disease, where those biological changes, perhaps informed by stress and stress response, those chemicals that may open the door for this process as one pathway. I could be in the pre-symptomatic phase where I've got the micro kind of changes that aren't detectable for anywhere 10, maybe up to 20 years. I could have mild symptoms for five to 10 years, or I could have more prominent symptoms for another 10 years. So this is a very long kind of a lifespan kind of effect in terms of shaping disease risk. And what we are finding out is that in midlife, what we do in terms of our cardiovascular health, in terms of managing stress, shapes our risk for not just the disease, but what accompanies that. And the more, if you click one more for me, if you would. So we know we can't cure something like Alzheimer's disease, if you click one more time, we know we can't cure it, but we know we can help people suppress how rapidly those changes are happening in the brain. And with that, we also know, if you can click one more time, that the more of those things that you do, the more likely you are to stay in the early phases of something like Alzheimer's disease related changes. So mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia and not get to mid or late stage. One more time, if you would. And maybe one more time after that. So with this, we think about where does mindfulness meditation intersect with this? There's a kind of a package of things that have a good evidence base, way outside the scope of this talk to dive into these. But one is absolutely treating your heart kind of risk factors. What goes for the heart goes doubly for the brain. You can click a couple more times here. Uh, medications, you know, we always think about the right medications for things, minimizing side effects from the wrong medications, including over-the-counter things. Click a couple more times here. And one more right there. I think, oh, go back if you would go. There we go. Uh, so, this is kind of the package. If you were to come to our clinic and say, I'm worried about my memory or I have MCI or mild cognitive impairment, what should I do? These are the things that we work on. And one of the big things is managing stress and distress. So, we know that untreated depression, Anxiety, PTSD, all these things raise risk for something like Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, and we know that once people develop something like this, it is inherently stressful. And the better they manage it, the better they tend to do. All right. So what's the mechanism for that? If you can click one more here. Uh, there is now decades worth of data looking at the brains of people who meditate versus those who don't and lots of excellent, really well done studies with functional MRI, some autopsy data, mostly functional MRI. And we know that people who meditate tend to have thicker connectivity between the regions of the brain. So if you think about the way the brain works, there's gray matter on the outside of the brain and then white matter, which is the deeper kind of wiring that connects areas. Uh, so people tend to have more robust connections. 
they tend to have thicker volumes in some subregions of the brain. We know that some of those areas of the brain also work a little bit better. They talk to each other better. Uh, and there's this thing called the default mode network that if you think about um, just sitting and doing nothing, your mind's kind of wandering or you're just kind of letting your thoughts kind of go, that is the default mode network where you're not engaged in a task, you're just kind of at rest. And how strong that network is, that pattern of activity, predicts how well you can shift to task activation. So we know people who meditate have a more robust kind of readiness for shifting into the next thing. Uh, the real world example of that is you're sitting there spacing out, thinking about something and somebody comes up and starts talking to you. How quickly can you orient to that and engage with that conversation versus, I'm sorry, what? And, right, which can be a point of friction sometimes. If you can click one more time. We also know that the cognitive functions that are served by those parts of the brain also change. And one of the biggest things that changes as we age is processing speed, how quickly we can process information. And one of the things that responds most robustly to a meditation practice, particularly mindfulness, is processing speed, uh, particularly auditory processing speed, but also our attention uh, and things like um, subcomponents of executive functioning, like how flexibly can I think about things? Right? So if something's not going the way I think it's gonna go, when can I detect that? step back and think about how else to do this. That's a great kind of an executive function. So lots of data about that. If you could go forward one more. Uh, we won't go through all of these, but here are some of the better done studies that look at, again, brains of those who meditate versus those who don't. When I looked at this, and it talks about what type of meditation, it talks about what parts of the brain seem to be involved and maybe what's the mechanism of action. Um, and it also talks about how long people have been meditating. And the thing that caught my eye was this one here, which was zero. So these are people who are novel. These are novel meditators, never meditated before. So brand new to it. And if you can click forward one. At the end of this study, so this is a composite image of a MRI. So this uh, image up top here on the right uh, would be if you're looking at my brain kind of this way, so a side view, sagittal view. The yellow areas are those with increased thickness after a meditation practice compared to people who just sat and did some relaxation exercises. So this is a wonderful example of the things that we do shapes the way our brain functions and looks. So that's, that's kind of the brain's purpose. It's a wonderfully plastic instrument that, or organ, that as we do things, the brain responds by those areas getting thicker, bigger, serving more of that purpose. Yes. What if you sit and read? If you sit and read, other parts of the brain will kind of respond to that. Yep, visual pathways. Maybe, well, if you know what? If you were sitting and reading and somebody's pestering you and you're still focusing on reading, that might be an area that would respond. That is our selective attention area. So, yeah, uh, language is a great example. Or... Um, you know, if you were somebody who did like a lot of jigsaw puzzles, you know, your parietal lobes are going to respond to that. That's the way the brain operates. But again, the beauty of this is, you know, these are older adults who never meditated and this effect shows up. What those structures do, what that means for disease risk, that wasn't clear at this time. But if you can go one more, if you would. Um, we also know that, and we talked a little bit about this last time, is that a meditation practice or a stress management practice, whatever you want to do or call it, helps us manage blood pressure better, our cholesterol levels drop, uh, our moods better, anxiety is better. Uh, can go for one more here. Uh, maybe, maybe two more. Yep. Uh, we also know that um, there's more blood flow to certain regions of the brain. It's again, activity. It's not like cardiovascular activity, but it helps with um, kind of sending more fuel to the brain. Uh, go ahead and click a couple more if you would. Keep going. There's all sorts of good reasons. Some of these we talked about last time. And these are all potential pathways for something like Alzheimer's disease. So historically we've called things, you know, dementia or way back when it was senility and that obscured a lot of very important differences and I think you're going to see the same thing with Alzheimer's disease in that there are many pathways to get there to those plaques and tangles that are the hallmarks. 
some of which are mediated by stress and stress hormones and inflammation, some of which may be more genetic or endocrine based. Uh, but these are all potential ways that something like meditation may intersect with risk for Alzheimer's, if not disease, then the symptoms of it. You can go ahead, a couple more here. Oh, and also um, in terms of alcohol, uh, you can stay there. But uh, The idea that when we're stressed out, and certainly true for both men and women, particularly true for men, particularly true for men, um, who don't have a lot of other tools often will turn to something like alcohol as a way to cope with stress. So by reducing that, that then reduces risk for Alzheimer's disease. So it might be mediated through some other pathways. So there may be some direct things. There may be some other ways that it's kind of mediated. We don't fully know. And this is kind of more of a theoretical model that we don't necessarily need to go through all of it. But if we click to the next one, we certainly have some evidence, and these aren't huge studies, but we have some evidence that meditation does make a difference in how people do Alzheimer's disease and that people with Alzheimer's disease absolutely can learn how to meditate, can practice meditation, and will experience some degree of benefit from that. No, you know, your, your mileage may vary, but um, one of the first studies that did a nice kind of job in a randomized control fashion, which was a... Um, Half of you are gonna meditate, half of you are gonna to listen to relaxing music. That's the control group. Uh, these are small samples, you know, so seven older adults with no cognitive impairment, five with mild cognitive impairment, three with Alzheimer's dementia. You can click one more if you would. Uh, the outcomes of this after an eight week training and practice, and then six months of that practice were improved blood flow to the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes. You can click one more. Uh, reduced blood flow to the part of the brain back here, which that sounds not so good when you first hear it, but when you think about that as a marker for that default mode network, that's exactly what that is. So reduced perfusion is actually good in the sense of that task readiness. If you can click one more. And uh, the, again, the, the functions that those parts of the brain subserve improved on testing afterwards, even for the people with early stage Alzheimer's dementia and mild cognitive impairment. They improve more for people with no cognitive impairment, but there's still a treatment effect there. And uh, go ahead and uh, might skip. Uh, I, I love brain imaging. I think it's one of the most interesting things, uh, getting a glimpse of something that we don't normally get to see. And this is a different type of a brain scan. This is a PET scan. So it's looking at how the brain uses fuel. It's a top-down view. And what you see is before the, this is a composite of all the participants with MCI and Alzheimer's disease. Before the program, this is a kind of, so here's uh, frontal lobes are here, back of the head's here, uh, same thing over there. So front's up top, back of the head's on the bottom. Afterwards, uh, you'll notice that in some of those regions, there's brighter red color, which means those areas are working better, more activation. And then you see it dropped out a little bit down there in the, the back. So uh, go ahead and uh, we'll skip forward a couple more here. Yeah, keep, keep going. Well, we can come back to these if you're super interested. Uh, there's one, so similar kind of findings in terms of cortical thickness and in the hippocampus. Keep going if you would. This is a more recent one and a really, really nicely done, larger sample size, more diverse sample size or sample, and looking at how thick the brain is in some of these regions for people with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. And what they found was after a meditation program about a year later, uh, increased thickness in the superior temporal gyrus, the insula, this part, right? There's that same kind of selective attention area. Uh, so again, we've got kind of study after study now. Uh, and this is, it's not as well-funded or well-researched as things like cardiovascular exercise and Alzheimer's disease, but it's a piece of the picture. So uh, go ahead and click forward. Also a really lovely study for caregivers. If you um, click forward to the one with just the results on it, I can talk about it. One more, yeah, perfect. So this was a similar design of, we're gonna teach you how to meditate, or we're gonna have you listen to relaxing music um, and randomly assign people to that group. And they measured, so these are care partners for people with 
dementia, or I think they were just dementia. It wasn't mild cognitive impairment. So people don't usually have a lot of care needs at that point. And they measured telomere length. Um, any biology experts in here who know what telomeres are? Can you explain that? How would you explain what a telomere is? End of a chromosome. Yep. So if you think about your shoelaces, you know, that little plastic cap that's on your shoelaces that keeps your shoelaces from fraying apart. It's kind of the thing that's on the ends of your genetic material. And it's a good marker of genetic integrity, cellular health. And what you see is that from the relaxation group, from the before in blue to the after in purple, no difference in telomere length, but a pretty significant difference for those who learned how to do meditation. So there you go. Um, go ahead and click forward one more. So I guess I would, I would sum it up again. You know, I, I think of this in the lens of what is stressful and certainly dealing with cognitive impairment, changes in your functional abilities because of cognitive impairment is incredibly stressful. Uh, what are some ways that we help people live well with those kinds of stresses? Uh, one is meditation. One is getting people moving, physical, physically active. Uh, and um, there are likely kind of multiple pathways. But I would not offer you that, you know, meditation is a cure for dementia. Absolutely not. Nor is it a cure for anxiety or depression or high blood pressure. Uh, it is not a cure for all that ails you or stresses you out. But I think it's an it's a effective tool with pretty few side effects and zero cost once you learn how to do it. Uh, that is part of that package of how to live well with things that stress us out. So that's, again, kind of the, the frame I'm thinking of this in. Um, and I think that is it for slides. Oh, uh, go ahead and click one more. The other thing I wanted to leave you with, you have a wonderful wellness committee here who is very invested in getting you doing mindfulness-based things. Um, and I, I love this card, which has lots of options, and there are lots of options. Um, and, you know, it's like any, you know, what's the best diet? The one you're going to do. What's the best exercise program? The one you're going to do. What's the best mindfulness activity? The one you're going to do. Um, some resources if you wanted to learn more. So Mindfulness Northwest is a great one. The Seattle Mindfulness Center is a great one. Uh, shameless, shameless self-promotion, the Fry Art Museum. Um, so I, I think I mentioned this last time. I've had the privilege of leading the meditations there since I think 2018. And during the pandemic, when that went virtual, we also went virtual. And I think there are 43 videos there of mindfulness meditations, everything from like a two minute up to a 30 minute, all different kinds of mindfulness meditations. I've run out of ideas at this point. So um, I don't think I'm gonna do that many more of them, but it's a, they're free, easy to access. And then these two kind of resources also, I think great in terms of um, learning a little bit more. Uh, and the one on the left, the Mindfulness for Beginners, is a wonderful one in the sense that there's a CD with a lot more information about what it is and how it works. And CD2 is a bunch of different meditations, anywhere from three minutes up to 30 minutes. Um, UCLA also has a wonderful set of resources, including some guided meditations. All right. And I think that is it for slides. Is that true? Click one more if you would. Oh, uh, one more has my contact information. So I, I left a copy, or I will leave a copy of these with your wellness committee. I sent uh, Dr. Ham a PDF of the one I did last time and this one. I'm happy to send it to you. Um, I didn't want to kill any more trees and print out more things. So I um, uh, electronic hopefully suffices. So right on schedule, look at that, 2.30. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking, up to you, but walking through a couple of different mindfulness exercises. Does that sound reasonable now that we've talked about kind of what it is and how it might help with certain things? Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to now stand up. I usually sit down, but I'll stand up. Um, so for this, I, and I want to, I want to contrast a couple of things. So I mentioned the, in the first talk that, you know, mindfulness is not a relaxation exercise, but dealing with stress, you know, finding ways, tools in the toolbox to help activate your parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and relax system, that is an effective way to at least kind of quiet down the noise that comes with stress. And the easiest ways that I know of to do that 
are to change your breathing and to change your muscle tone. Those are things that send signals to your parasympathetic system to shut off some of that fight or flight or sympathetic nervous system activation. So what those look like are this. So I'll, uh, I'll invite you, we'll do a couple of those and we'll do a, a mindfulness one that's similar, but I think you'll appreciate the differences. So I will invite you to, as you're sitting in your chair, uh, allowing your eyes to close, if you would, if you're comfortable with them closed. Otherwise, maybe just focusing on an area without too much visual input. And I'm going to ask you just to notice your breathing for a second. And I'm going to ask you to also think about something that is a source of stress in your life currently. It could be a relationship, it could be a health problem, it could be things going on in the world, pain, whatever, whatever may be a stressor for you. And noticing your breathing again, which you may identify as shallow or rapid. And to the best of your ability, slowing your breathing down just a little bit, doing your best to try to shift that out of the chest into the stomach for a count of about three seconds in and about three seconds out. So we're just slowing the breathing down. About three seconds in. You could pause for a second and three seconds out. And if we spend about three minutes engaged in that kind of diaphragmic breathing, so it's coming from the diaphragm, that's usually enough, and you're, you're welcome to reopen your eyes or refocus, that three minutes of three seconds in, at least three seconds out, but maybe not a lot longer out, is enough to re-regulate that sympathetic, parasympathetic activation that we get when we're stressed out. Uh, doesn't always work. Uh, but what you'll notice, and when you teach people how to do diaphragmic breathing, so if I am breathing through my chest, it kind of looks like it's up here, right? And the challenge with that is my rib cage can only expand and contract so much. So I can't take real deep breaths. But if I'm breathing through my diaphragm, it looks like this. So that, you know, if you've ever watched babies or little kids breathe, they breathe through their diaphragms. And sometimes as we age, and uh, especially women in our culture, you're taught to suck in the gut, and that kind of forces breathing up here. Uh, and that's hard to relearn uh, for some people, not always. But teaching people how to do that kind of three seconds in, three seconds out is one of those tools for kind of relaxation. That's a classic relaxation strategy. The thing is, if you breathe too deeply, and you blow off too much carbon dioxide, you actually get more anxious. So you have to be careful about how deep that breath is. So we need a certain amount of carbon dioxide in the blood to activate that relaxation response. Another kind of relaxation strategy or technique is progressive muscle relaxation. So for this one, and anybody do this or been taught this in the past, it's, you know, people sometimes do it to help with pain or to fall asleep. Uh, this looks like this. So I'll again, invite you to uh, close your eyes as you're sitting in your chair or standing. And we're gonna go through the body in some different regions and just practice tensing and releasing some muscle groups. And I would encourage you not to tense anything too much. You don't wanna cause pain or cramping or anything like that. But starting with your toes, curling them into a ball, we're pressing them down into the floor and holding that for a second. 
noticing that sensation of tension around the knuckles of your toes. Maybe you start to feel it in the arch and then relaxing that fully, almost like they're kind of melting into the floor and noticing the difference between that relaxation and that feeling of tension. Similarly, if you bring your toes up towards your shin off the floor a little bit, like you're raising them, hold that for a few seconds, noticing that feeling of tension in your shins, and then relaxing them fully, letting them drop back down. You could also notice this in the thighs, almost like you're getting ready to push yourself up out of the chair or stand up, just engaging those, holding that for a second. And now allowing those to relax fully and appreciating that sensation of heaviness, relaxation. If we move up to the hands and the forearms, if you ball your hands into fists, clench those, not too tight. But notice that sensation of tension around the knuckles, the forearms, the backs of the hands maybe, holding that and now relaxing them entirely and letting them kind of fall into your lap. So that's a very incomplete, but kind of a quick view of progressive muscle relaxation. You start with the toes and you go all the way up through the major systems of the body, you get up to the top of the head, you know, the forehead, you can wrinkle that, you can clamp your eyes down, but appreciating those differences between muscle tension and muscle relaxation. So like breathing, that relaxation of muscles sends that signal to the nervous system that it's okay to relax and shuts off some of that fight or flight activation. So these are classic relaxation strategies. You know, if you went to a rehab center for back pain or chronic pain, uh, often they will teach you how to do some of these things to turn the volume down on pain, which also activates part of that same system. Mindfulness meditation is a little different. And we'll do it, then we can talk about how it's different. So for this, kind of like the very first in, in the muscle relaxation, I am going to invite you to allow your eyes to close. And again, the eyelids would be falling gently together, not pressed or clenched. Or allowing your gaze to rest somewhere without too much visual input. I will also invite you to bring your attention to your breathing. Noticing whatever sensations you notice with air entering and leaving the body. You don't have to change your breathing at all. Just noticing air coming in and out. You may notice what parts of the body move as you breathe. You may notice the qualities of the breath. If it's relaxed or effortful. Shallow or deep, whatever it may be. Just resting the attention on those sensations. Could be a cool sensation around the rim of the nostrils as you breathe in. A warmer sensation as you breathe out. You may also notice that the mind tends to wander to other things. You may notice sounds, other sensations in the body, thoughts, emotions, all of these other aspects of the present moment. 
And the practice here is each time you notice that your mind gets caught up by some other aspect of the moment, just making note of that and gently returning it back to your breathing without any judgment or self-criticism if the mind wanders or when the mind wanders. Just over and over again, bringing it back to focus on your breathing. So the goal is not to eliminate all distractions, just noticing when the mind drifts somewhere else and choosing to return your attention back to your breathing over and over. No special experience or state to be achieved. Just the practice of cultivating mindful attention. You may also experiment with attending to other aspects of the present moment, including sounds. Just noticing these without any evaluation or need to name what's causing them or evaluate them as pleasant or unpleasant wanted or unwanted. You may notice that some things that sound constant, like the ventilation system, actually has some fluctuation to it. You may also notice where things occur in space. Or whether sounds come and go. When you are ready, returning your attention back to your breath, noticing that sensation of air entering and leaving the body, co-occurring with sounds, thoughts, random chatter of the mind, other sensations. And when you are ready, allowing your eyes to open, and there you go. Um, I think what I would say, and I, I think you likely can appreciate the differences between diaphragmic breathing and muscle relaxation in that practice, that, that intentional focus 
on some aspect of the moment, and it doesn't really matter what that is. Uh, I typically, I like sounds. I focus on sounds often. Um, but the key is that anchor, some anchor to which you will return again and again and again each time the mind wanders. And without any judgment or self-criticism, the mind wandering is perfectly natural. You know, I think of it as every time it does, that's an opportunity to practice noticing, oh, I'm thinking about that again. And not, oh, it's bad that I'm doing that. Just, oh, I'm thinking about that again. And then bringing it back to the breathing. So it's that practice over and over again uh, with some self-compassion. This is not easy. It's simple, but not easy. Uh, with some self-compassion that there's no quick kind of outcome for this. Like, I'm going to do this for a week or two weeks and I'm going to sleep better or have less pain or less anxiety or less depression. Um, so there's no kind of, there's intention in practicing it without attachment to the outcome. And, you know, there are walking meditations. Some people, I, I don't like to sit. You know, so great, you know, there's walking ones. You could do it chopping vegetables. You could do it driving, maybe not. Um, so it really, it, it's not the technique in and of itself. It's that intentional, I'm focusing on this. I'm noticing when my mind goes somewhere else. And with that, over time, I think, I was thinking about this walking here is that the difference between pain and suffering, right? Pain is a physical sensation. Suffering is kind of the emotional component of that and the story that we tell ourselves about that pain. And it's, I think one of the benefits about mindfulness is that cultivation of awareness of the stories that we're telling ourselves about things, which is often intimately related to stress in the sense of I've got to do this or I should have done that, or that's, that's a part for a lot of folks. So you know, some connectivity there too. Um, and, you know, I, I want to also respect that there are so many different forms of meditation. You know, some people really, really love and benefit from transcendental meditation, some from Zazen, some from Vipassana, some from, you know, prayer. Uh, it, there's no one right way to do this. So there are as many forms of meditation as there are meditators. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes. I probably talked at you enough. Um, what else should we talk about? Questions. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have a microphone. I'm happy to repeat questions too. But raise your hand if you have a question. Yes. One of the options on the card is insight meditation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us just what that is? Uh, well, I, I have an idea about it, but I'm curious for your team who put that together, what were you thinking? It was just from the list. So. <laughs> well, where'd the list come from? Uh, I, I think, you, right, yep. So do you wanna, you wanna address that? That's not my area of expertise, but um, yeah. So Vipassana meditation is one that's kind of aimed at a little bit more self-investigation and a meditation that's not just kind of cultivating attention to the moment, but also those kind of internal parts of ourselves. And um, it's, um, I don't know how else I would, I would frame it up. Who would lead that here? I guess I'm wondering, how would you, how would you do that? Not sure yet. Okay. Um, yes. I would, I'm, I understand there's no sure cure, but if this whole program were instituted at a young age when the brain is fully developed, would that prevent some of the diseases that are associated with old age now? You know, you, that, that is a wonderful question and it's such an important one. One of the slides that I kind of moved over quickly was some of the work done by the Lancet Commission, mostly on Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So, you know, related to things like blood pressure, diabetes, you know, other diseases. Uh, if we could improve early life educational opportunities for children, that would eliminate about 7% of all dementias. And it does that by a couple of ways, right? So one is that you, but you think about kids and when they're born from a neurological standpoint, they're producing massive amounts of brain cells, more than they'll ever use, right? 
but the ones that get recruited and used stick around, otherwise they get pruned off. That's the way development happens. So with more complex environments, educational opportunities, there's more structure to stick around. There's more connectivity to this cortical reserve. There's cognitive reserve, plus better education means better occupation, health literacy, access to good food. I mean, there's so many things that go into that. But that, that, that's one example of, you know, 7% of all dementias by better educational opportunities for kids. And then absolutely, you know, things like diabetes, other heart-related diseases, yeah. And let alone depression, anxiety, all the things that come from you know, tough childhoods, adverse childhood events. Yeah, great, great point. Yes. What do you have to say about chanting? I like it. <laughs> oh, it's great. No, I, you know, and that's, that's the thing about, um, for some people, that is such a wonderfully focusing thing, right? And if that is what does it for you, you know, whether it's a mantra or chanting, absolutely. You know, whether there's some added benefit, I think that depends on the person. Um, I, I think it's great. Yeah. Your neighbors might disagree. I don't know, but um, it depends on where you do it, maybe. But yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm happy to repeat the question, too. Yep. Oh, you're asking me um, does the number of times one falls on their head make a difference in terms of uh, risk for something like uh, memory changes or dementia or other? Yeah, you know, that's a, it's a complex relationship and falling on your head's one thing, a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury is a different thing. So we all get bumps and, you know, bruises. Uh, but what we know is that, you know, if it's accompanied by, you know, loss of consciousness or loss of memory, uh, post-concussive symptoms like headache, nausea, light sensitivity, and if those happen in close sequence, when the brain hasn't had a full chance to recover, Yes, there's an increased risk of things like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, other neurological diseases. It's not a one-to-one -one, and there's no magic formula of, oh, if you have more than four head injuries, you're gonna develop dementia. It, it doesn't work like that. But there's an association. It's not entirely well understood, but yeah. But it's different than just a, a fall and, and whacking your head. That that might not, and that's that's in, you know, in military and professional sports, that's a big, area of interest of, you know, sub threshold impacts and how many can you have before maybe we need to worry about it. But yeah, that's a long answer to say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, the importance of, or the value of a lot of stimulation for children when they're uh, growing up, when their brains are developing. Uh, but what about stimulation from things like the television and the, you know, the v digital stuff? There's a lot of stimulation there, but is is it a good kind or de uh, detrimental? Boy, you know, that's a, that's a fantastic question, and it depends on which study you look at. So there was one that was just published earlier this week that says... Uh, Adolescents who spend more time on their phone and playing video games actually have better cognitive function. You know, uh, we don't know. We don't know. What I what I worry about is, um, you know, there, I, I think of them. And I, this is not my term, but I love it. Uh, weapons of mass distraction, right? And what that does to our attention span, what that does to our ability to kind of connect with each other and interact and. You know, as the, the parent of a 14 year old, um, you know, it's a lot of shepherding into, you know, non digital things. You know, so it, yeah, it's, I, we, it's going to be so interesting to see how people of you know, younger generations who were born with this technology and TVs and other things age and what that means. But it, it really does. It depends on the study you look at and what you're measuring, perhaps. Other questions? Yes. Here. So that's a fantastic question. How does the benefit of meditation compare to the benefit of cardiovascular exercise or activity? Uh, and if we're thinking about benefit, benefit in terms of stress management or uh, well, benefit in terms of uh, memory and brain function, yeah. cardio, cardio's up here, meditation's kind of here, doing nothing's here. Okay, 
Yep. You know, I, and I, I say this all the time, the data supports this, that uh, if you were going to do one thing to maximize the likelihood of your cognitive health, it would be cardiovascular exercise. It has the biggest return on investment. Problem is you have to do it. Yeah. But yeah. You know, and the, but the interesting thing too, though, is that and the beauty is it's not neither an or, but for some people who can't exercise at that level, when we look at, when you do more than one thing, there does seem to be this additive protective benefit. So one plus one plus one may equal five in terms of benefit versus just doing one of those things. Got a question in the back there. Um, the other thing as, as you're getting ready to ask this question, I want to emphasize is that this is really, it's a practice. You know, meditation, it's not a mastery event. It's not like learning how to ride a bike or learning the rules of addition. It is an ongoing practice and it's not an easy one. It's really challenging at times. So that self-compassion is also a, boy, I haven't done this in a few days. Well, you're human, right? And one of our biggest challenges is kind of getting back on track when we get off track. And we all get off track for a variety of reasons. So just want to emphasize that, you know, this is this is hard work, even though it's pretty straightforward in terms of what it is. Yes. Uh, is it possible for a medication to help with stress? Medication? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's, you know, the, I, boy, thank you for that question. So important to talk with your provider, your primary care provider, around options. And sometimes it's a, yeah, you know, there's a short-term medication that might help kind of get you some traction to do the other things. And for others, it's a, you know, this is something that's just going to need to be part of the picture to help you kind of get where you need to go and not suffer so much. So there's definitely a place for that. And it's easy, I think, sometimes not to talk about that, especially with primary care providers, because they, you know, they're dealing with so much, but absolutely worth a conversation. Okay. One more question. One more. Yep. Oh, a statement. That's that's even better. Some years ago, I came across a quotation from a woman who had been a professional dancer, mm -hmm. dancer, and then she retired, and realized that her life was better when she was dancing, and her words were, "Living." without living will wrinkle the skin, but living without enthusiasm will wrinkle the soul. Ah, that is a fantastic <laughs> statement. I like it. I, I couldn't end it on a better note. All right. Uh, it was, the, the, the statement was uh, living, what was it, living? Living will wrinkle the skin. Living will wrinkle the soul or the heart. Yep. Living without enthusiasm will wrinkle the soul. So there you go. All right. It's tough to maintain that enthusiasm sometimes, but important. My pleasure. Yes. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Uh, it's very uh, stimulating presentation. Uh, we've learned something about how the brain works, a little more about physiology and anatomy associated with stress and dementia, and a, a few things that we can do to help slow that process. And I think it also leads to a, a greater sense of well-being. So uh, uh, I know uh, there's mention of these cards that you have. So we do want you to fill out your preference for uh, meditation practice. And, and Jim Spraker, the chairman of the committee will be up here in a moment, but I have two uh, announcements to make, not directly related to this, but uh, first the uh, veterans recognition uh, program uh, on Veterans Day, uh, November 11th is not going to be uh, formally uh, pre uh, presented, but there will be a recognition. And I urge all the veterans uh, in this uh, audience and those watching on HHTV to fill out the uh, form that you can find in the mail room. 
and that will help uh, uh, with the planning of this recognition. Um, the other thing is that uh, many of you, well, actually most of us, I think, are taking medication for something, and uh, a lot of it uh, has expired or is no longer being used and is, uh, is sitting in our uh, medication cabinets. And tomorrow, the uh, drop box uh, on B1 level is going to be removed and emptied. So I urge all of you to look and find those medications uh, expired or not used anymore and bring them down to that drop box today or tomorrow morning because that will be removed uh, later in the day tomorrow. Um, pardon? Oh, no, the, the box is emptied periodically, but I think it's getting full and they're going to uh, do that tomorrow. Um, it's on in B at the B1 level. It's near the uh, uh, sw swimming pool, I think. In yeah, it's in the little in the little hallway next to the swimming pool. Going into good. I tried yes. to use it the other day. I couldn't get it open. I asked someone else to come over and tell me couldn't get it open. But then when I went up to the, the drugstore, the guy said to me, "Show me what you were going to put in it." And then he came out with a key and opened it. So I, how did we open the one downstairs? Good question. Um, is there an answer? Because I haven't used it yet. I, I don't know either. I, I put stuff in it. Well, how did you get it? Is it open? Yeah. But when I tried it the other day, it did not open. All right. We'll we'll look into that and come up okay. with an answer. Okay. I do uh, want to thank everybody who's uh, present here today, and I hope you've learned something about uh, more, something more about the neurophysiology and anatomy and how that might be uh, improved with uh, wellness practice. And uh, I'll turn this off. Well, and also a warm uh, thank you to Dr. Rhodes uh, for this wonderful presentation. Now we're here going to hear from Jim Spraker, the uh, committee chairman who will tell us what to do with these cards. Yeah. Um, so we want you to fill these out and I will collect them in ye old basket. And um, what we'll do, what's that? Okay, uh, we have pencils around. We'll get you something to write with. We will collect these along with those that we did in the safety fair, and we'll select four of your top choices. And in January, we're going to put together a series of workshops and demonstrations so that you can come and see what those particular mindfulness processes look like and feel like. Our goal is to create groups where you can practice the mindfulness processes. Because as Dr. Rhodes said, it's not knowing about them, it's doing them. And that if we are working together in, in a supportive atmosphere, then we'll be able to have better results. If you find that you have five or six friends that are really, really interested, come and talk to me and we'll get started maybe a little early. So January, we'll publish where they'll be and when they'll be, and they'll be small groups, 15 or less. And we'll demonstrate, we'll have someone demonstrate the processes and you can then, we'll, from interest, we'll form groups. Okay, thank you all very much and have a pleasant afternoon.